way of thinking how big you are compared to the atoms and the parts of atoms, and then you're an enormous universe to those atoms. So you can sort of stand in the middle and enjoy everything both ways. But uh, the real great part of astronomy is the imagination that's necessary to guess what kinds of structures, what kinds of things can be happening to produce the light and the effects of the light and so on of the stars that we do see. And uh, I could take an example, a historical example, See, many times in science, by using imagination, you can imagine something which could be according to all knowledge of the world, and you don't know whether it is yet. And that's very interesting. There's a creative imagination, you like to call it, not just imagining things that are relatively easy, but something different. And to take an example of a star, as we understand it, an ordinary star like the sun is a great big ball of gas of hydrogen. It's burning up the hydrogen and so forth, and it's an enormous mass held together by gravity. You don't have to always understand gravity as curved space. It's good enough for this purpose that force inversely is square of the distance from things are closer together, the force is square. And it pulls everything together. By the way, that's why the world is round. Because the globe of Earth is pulled together as much as possible and it had a great mountain and an irregularity of a bumper, so it would be pulled in by gravity and it would get smooth. Rocks aren't strong enough to hold a bump much bigger than a few miles of Anyway, to get back to the star, it's all held together by gravity, and it's got a nuclear fuel, which we've been talking about, that's burning up the hydrogen and generating energy, which keeps things going. And after a while, it would use the fuel up. Well, people began to think about what would happen then. And it would be possible to just be gas sort of hanging around, held together by gravity, but quiet. But another possibility was to think, if I push the stuff together closer, gravity is stronger, would it hold together? Well, if you push a little bit together, the pressure increases. When you push gas together, there are more atoms and they pound harder, so the pressure's higher, but the gravity is stronger, and it turns out the pressure wins, so it will just come out again. If you push it, that's right, and it will oscillate, and there are some stars that are oscillating, like radius. But it turns out, if you keep on analyzing, and you push it together very far to the incredible concentration of the whole mass of the sun is down to the size of the earth or smaller. And then in terms of all the nuclear matter, all the nuclei and the atoms are all stuck next to each other tight. The electrons are the spaces where the electrons are it's all squashed out and it comes out. And when you get to that far, the gravity is strong enough. It's overpowered the pressure again. Even though the pressure's got to be enormous, the gravity's got to be even more enormous. Stay steady at a different size. There will be nothing but neutrons. Nuclear matter, nothing solid. Uh, and this is a possibility that's worked out by Oppenheimer and Oppenheimer. It's called the neutron star. And people waited to see if there were any such neutron stars for years. Recently, we found these strange pulsars which emit flashes of uh, radio waves.
case of astronomy, we have a large number of things that we see that we are not yet quite clearly got the imagination to see. One of those is producing quasars, very powerful sources of light and radio waves from very great distances. They can see them as this one. And uh, the exact cause of their sources only gradually being recently understood in terms of another very concept of imagination. Something that comes from following the logic of the gravity theory of Einstein to its ultimate, working out the consequences of crazy circumstances. Suppose you had an amount of matter so great that the gravity force is so much that even light trying to get out falls back. Nothing could go as fast as light, and nothing could escape. You couldn't see it. How would you get there? If you had a lot of matter to start with, it could fall together and get into this condition, and no longer could the light come out. So you would have this thing which would continue to attract things to it. Things would go in and nothing would come out. That's called a black hole. And you say, well, how can a black hole, which is absorbing everything, make all this energy that we see? Is that an explanation of the quasar? Actually, it may well be, because if the things are falling in, don't go plonk in, but go around falling in by swirling, and as they fall in and they irregularly and so forth, and in the fast motions that it produces, they go down to this whirlpool, they generate a lot of energy and friction and so forth, and different kinds of effects, magnetic effects that can make the jets of matter that come out of the quasar and the radio galaxies in ways that are not really understood. You don't have a real picture of why there are jets of the radio waves and so on, the radio matter emitting radio waves. Galaxies, there are galaxies, which great jets have come out of big clouds of matter on each side, which are made of radio waves. So there's some kind of a source in there that sort of gets wound up and shoots these jets of material with tremendous energy. And it's guessed that maybe that's a black hole somehow or other. And the somehow or other is the challenge of imagination, which has not yet been answered by anybody with any great confidence. You would ask me if an ordinary person, by studying hard, would get to be able to imagine these things like I imagine. Of course, I was an ordinary person who studied hard. There's no miracle, people. It just happens they got interested in this thing and they learned all this stuff. They're just people. There's no talent, a special miracle ability to understand quantum mechanics or a miracle ability to imagine electromagnetic fields that comes without practice and reading and learning and study. So if you say, you take an ordinary person who's willing to devote a great deal of time, and he's become a scientist.
then it turns out if you repeat that, you can do very accurately. When you get to 48 or 47 or 49 on, you want to be very close to a minute. And, and I would try to find out what affected that time sense and whether I could do anything at the same time as I was counting. And I found that I could do many things. I could, uh, there were some things that not. For example, I, I had great difficulty if I was going to high university and I had to get my laundry ready. And I was putting the socks on. And I had to make a list how many socks, you know, something like six or eight socks, and I couldn't count them. Because the counting machine was being used and I couldn't count them. Until I found out I could put them in a pattern and recognize the number. And so I learned a way after practicing by which I could go down the lines of type of newspapers and see them in groups three, 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 one, well, that's a group of ten, three, 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 one, well, without seeing the numbers, just seeing the group numbers. And I could therefore count the lines of type I practiced in the newspaper at the same time I was counting internally with the seconds. And so I would come, I could do this fantastic trick of saying, 48, that's a one minute, and there are 67 lines of type. It was quite wonderful. And I discovered many things I could read while I was, uh, no, I, excuse me, yes. Yes, I could read perfectly all right while I was counting and get an idea of what it was about. But I couldn't speak, I couldn't say anything. Because of course, I was sort of, when I counted, I sort of spoke to myself inside. I would say one, two, or three, sort of. Hey. Well, I went down to the breakfast, and there was uh, John Tukey, who was a mathematician down at Princeton at the same time, and we had many discussions, and I was telling him about these experiments and what I could do. And he says, that's absurd, he says. He says, I don't see why you would have any difficulty talking whatsoever, and I can't possibly believe that you could read. So I couldn't believe all this, but we calibrated him. It was 52 for him to get to 60. And then he'd say, all right, he said, what do you want me to say? There he had a little lamp. I could speak about anything. Blah, 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 blah. 52 minutes a minute. That was right. And I couldn't possibly do that. And he wanted me to read because he couldn't believe it. And then we compared notes. And it turned out that what he thought of counting, what he did with inside his head with what he counted, was he saw a tape with numbers and a print tape with tape with numbers printed on it. He could see well, since it's sort of an optical system that he's using, and not voice, he could speak as much as he wanted. But if he had to read, then he couldn't look at his clock. Whereas for me, it was the other way. And that's where I discovered, at least in this very simple operation of counting, the great difference in what goes on in the head when people think they're doing the same thing. And so it struck me, therefore, if that's already true at the most elementary level, we learn all the things of the muscle functions and the exponentials and the electric fields and all these things. <laughs> that the imagery and method by which we're storing it all, the way we think about it, could be really a replication to each other's heads entirely different. And in fact, why somebody sometimes.